So after the Second World War, this is what the map of Europe would have looked like. Well, 27 different nations represented there, all responsible for their own effectively internal policy, philosophy, lifestyle. But of course, since 1957 and the establishment of the Club of Rome, which was initially an economic cooperation or economic cooperative organization, but it has grown into a 27 nation super state. And right now, a governor of a state in the US has more power, more autonomy than a prime minister of a European nation. There is more federal law in Europe than there is in the US. And Europe as a federation has been around for well, exactly 51 years, well, 50, 50 years, 50 years and six months, isn't it? March 15th, 1957. It's been around for exactly you know, 50 years and there is more federal legislation than the US, which has been around for what, 231. But this is only the start of things to come, because whilst the Europe has been coming together as a super state, this has been happening in other areas of the world. We have the League of African Nations, the League of Arab Nations, the Asia Pacific Economic Community, the Southeast Asia Economic Community, and the one that's coming really fast down the track is the North American Union. This is so imminent, it's being brought about by the collapse of the dollar. You know, interestingly enough, if you look at the graphs, and there was one published in the, uh, in the Independent just a few days ago, and it shows the start of the decline of the dollar at the moment that George Bush was appointed to the White House by the democratic process of the Supreme Court ruling five to three in his favor. And that's the start of the decline. And we haven't seen the end of it by any stretch of the imagination. The intention is to create the North American Union. And, and if you think that this is, um, you know, fantasy, it just so happens that once again I picked up the magazine of the National uh, Natural Health Federation, Health Freedom News, and the president, sorry, the chairman of that organisation, who I'll mention later, is a, a Brit by the name of Paul Anthony Taylor, and his lead article in this edition is the North American Union: an amusing joke or a super government in the making. This guy is one of the lead players on the non-government organization that has rights to participate in the codex process. So if anybody knows what he's talking about and what he's experiencing, it should be Paul Anthony Taylor. There's another reason, apart from the economic relationship, which is perhaps even more sinister, that the US desperately wants to create the North American Union, and that is because their military is struggling to recruit, funnily enough. So by opening the borders, I don't think they're going to get too many Canadians signing up for the military, but the Mexicans will be streaming across the border. So all of a sudden, this North American Union, which is you know, just the next step on from the North American Free Trade Association, which of course the EU is just the same step beyond the um, European economic community. Once that happens, then they will have a North American army. And what you'll see is that wherever it is that the US wants to uh, pursue its agenda of hegemony, it'll be mainly Mexicans. The next step is going to be is the merger of the American Union with the EU, making it the most powerful economic bloc obviously in the world. It will be totally dominant economically. And it will very quickly swallow up all the other trade communities. All under the banner of the United Nations. The symbolism of the United Nations flag is very significant. That grid that's over the top of the world is very significant. It's very aggressive looking symbol underneath it. Anybody recognize that symbol? The World Bank. The World Bank. And a book that I would highly recommend to you. By the way, I don't usually bring so much of my research material, but with this particular subject, so many people think that this is just fantasy. I, thought, I have to bring some material, so that if you want, later on, you can come and have a look for yourselves. But this is a book called The Confessions of an Economic Hitman by a guy called John Perkins, who spent many years working for the World Bank or for subsidiaries of the World Bank. And his job was to go into developing nations and persuade the governments to buy in to massive credit plans, basically to bring that developing nation government into hock. Because just like on the microcosm, you know, once you've got an individual in serious debt, 
basically you've got them under control. And the same thing with the macrocosm. If you can get a nation into serious debt, then you, know, you basically have them where you want them. And it shouldn't come as any great surprise to you that there's, some, there's a very common denominator between all the countries that are classified as the axis of evil. This Bush term. And it's the countries like Cuba, um, North Korea, Iran, recently Russia. Anyone, anybody wondered why Russia has been demonized in the media, basically, for the last six months? Well, all of these countries, oh, and Venezuela, of course, and an increasing number of Latin American countries as Venezuela and Chavez starts to find ways to help these guys out of their debt to the World Bank. These guys, all of these countries that are part of the axis of evil, are free of debt. And Russia paid off its last instalment for all the billions that it borrowed after the collapse of the Soviet bloc back in 1990. So Putin had actually done an amazing job by appointing the seven ugly sisters, the seven oligarchs, to manage the industrial recovery. Of course, some of those oligarchs got a little bit too carried away and just wanted a bit too much power, and that's why you know, Putin has a bit of a problem with one or two of them. But his strategy was absolutely sound, because what he did was he identified the best guys in the country to take their particular industries and bring them you know, back up to full speed and obviously enable Russia to become self-sufficient. And Russia is in exactly that position right now. The World Bank has a couple of henchmen to carry out its will, and that is the World Trade Organization, which has been around since 1995, and the World Health Organization. Now, these two organizations are complete misnomers, because let me assure you that the World Trade Organization has nothing really to do with world trade, and the World Health Organization definitely has nothing to do with health. Basically, any country that is signed up to membership of the World Trade Organization is effectively under the auspices of the UN. So anything that the World Trade Organization deems to be law, the member countries have to abide by. And I'll give you one example that you won't be aware of. The World Trade Organization have deemed it quite legitimate for the US to export its hormone impregnated beef. And it sees no reason why any nation, certainly any member nation, should reject the importation of um, uh, contaminated beef, i.e. Con con contaminated with the growth hormone. The EU at the moment refuses to import the American beef so the EU has to pay a fine to the World Trade Organization of 150 million euros a year because we don't want their contaminated beef. And that fine will increase as we continue to, as the EU continues to reject it, then the fine increases until they can you know, make the pit squeak and in the end they, what they expect you to do is go, okay, okay, we take it. Now who's going to eat it? Well, but you won't know because a big part of Codex is to remove the labeling on foods, as we shall see. Now, the EU, a lot of people are under the misapprehension or misimpression that the EU is a, a democratic organization. Let me categorically assure you it's not. First of all, I mean, you know, we could get into the debate about whether you can actually mention the two phrases, democracy and a three-line whip, in the same breath. I mean, a three-line whip is not democracy. And that's exactly what we have here. But the EU is even worse. When you elect your MEP, it basically is about as effective as electing your shop steward if you're a member of the trade union. Just as your shop steward, you're electing to represent you to the management, but the shop steward has absolutely, well not in this country anyway, in Germany and France it's slightly different, but the shop steward has no um, role in terms of determining the strategy or the direction of the company. And this is exactly the case with the MEPs. They are a consultative body. Nothing more, nothing less. They are a consultative body. The real power lies with the trade commissioners. And the most powerful trade commissioner, or sorry, the most powerful commissioner of the EU is the trade commissioner, and of course you know who that is. You know, the most honest British politician. Oh. Yeah, I mean, how many times did this guy get bounced out of the cabinet? It was at least twice, and he might, I think he might have got out a third time before he got bounced. 
But this is the guy with the power to determine what the EU does and doesn't participate in with the World Trade Organization. And needless to say, of course, you know, we're going down, he's taking the EU down that, uh, down that track. And the EU doesn't have a president yet, but in the Constitution, you know, it does call for a president, which also will be um, not elected, it will be appointed. And you know who's been promised the presidency? Why do you think he has to convert to Catholicism? There's no way a Protestant can be president of the EU. The EU is a Catholic entity. It's not called the Club of Rome for nothing. So Tony, to become EU president, has to convert to Catholicism. There he is, there he is. Just in case you've forgotten what he looked like. And he's out of the country. What is he out in the Middle East now? You know, um, peace peace minister or whatever the title they call him you know it's like putting King Herod in charge of the kindergarten <laughs> at least there's one good thing about it nobody trusts him and Gordon Brown of course just desperately wanted him out of the country right now I think he probably desperately wanted him back in but at the time he didn't want to be second guessed by Tony so he wanted him as far away as possible but uh, I, I have this picture which I think is a far better view of Tony and one which I think um, I hope to live to see one day. 